Welcome to the Human Cell Atlas Biological Network Seminar featuring the heart and musculoskeletal networks. Welcome everyone. So the seminar series goals are to increase the biological network visibility and to spark new opportunities for collaboration and engagement. It's to promote coordination with other networks such as the CZIC networks. It is also to lay the groundwork for drafting Atlas roadmaps in each biological area in preparation for work sessions at our upcoming virtual uh, HCA general meeting, which will take place June 28th through the 20, uh, June 28th through the 30th. So if you have not registered for that, we really encourage you to get registered for that meeting. Um, so this seminar takes place the second Thursday of each month, 10.30 to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we just want to let you know that this, now, uh, this seminar series is made possible through the support of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So if you have questions throughout the seminar, we encourage you to submit those questions using slido.com HCA backslash HCA bio network, or you can also scan the QR code up at the top right. You can also submit a question at any time by going to the Q&A tab, which we have circled here in red. So questions with the most votes will be prioritized. So even if you're not asking questions, we encourage you to vote on questions. So we'd like to have you participate in a very quick uh, survey here. So please go scan the QR code. And the first question is, what would you like to get out of this seminar? So I'm gonna give everyone 15 seconds to let us know what they would like to get out of today's seminar. Networking, I see an update. Potential collaboration, these are all great. Great, so keep those rolling in. The next question that we have for you is how did you hear about the seminar? And it's really important for us to understand how we are reaching out to folks. Um, so, please let us know because we will tailor our communication strategy based on, on the responses here. So it looks like a colleague or friend is taking the lead, but please continue um, responding. And then the last question that we have for you is, are you a part of any of the HCA biological networks? So um, the great news is if you are not part of any of the networks, you have the opportunity to sign up at the end of our seminar today. Um, so stay tuned on how to do that. All right, so the seminar format, we're gonna have a 15 minute talk by Jonathan Seidman followed by five minute Q&A. Then Christopher Buckley will give his talk, again, 15 minute talk followed by five minute Q&A. And then we will go into our breakout sessions. Um, we will post the Zoom links of the breakout sessions right before going to the breakout sessions. And just note that you will not return to this webinar room after the breakout sessions. We will end the seminar in the breakout sessions. So with that being said, I wanna welcome Jonathan and turn it over to my colleague, Ellen Todris, who will give a brief introduction, Ellen. Yes, hi everyone. We're very happy and grateful to welcome Jonathan Seidman. Today, uh, Jonathan Seidman is the Henrietta and Frederick uh, Buer Professor of Cardiovascular Genetics at Harvard Medical School. He received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University in 1972 and his PhD degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison. His postdoctoral studies were carried out in Dr. Philip Leder's laboratory at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. He has been a member of the genetics department at Harvard Medical School since 1981. The Seidman Laboratory, which Jonathan co-runs with his wife, Christine Seidman, um, 
studies the genetic basis of human disease. The laboratory's principal focus of research is genetic and non-genetic approaches to define mechanisms leading to human cardiac disease. The current focus of the research is defining the genetic contribution of both adult and pediatric cardiovascular disease using genomic approaches, including target capture, DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, single cell RNA-seq, and CHIP-seq. To further understand the mechanisms by which gene mutations cause disease, the lab models human mutations in animals and cultured cells. Most recently, they have ass assessed the effects of sarcomere protein titan mutations on contractile function in induced pluripotent stem cells derived cardio, uh, cardiomyocytes. Dr. Seidman is a member of the Genetics Society of America and the American Society of Human Genetics. He has received several awards, including the 12th Annual Bristol Myers Squibb Award for Distinguished Achievement in Cardiovascular Research in 2002, jointly with Christine Seidman, uh, the uh, Lefelon Delon Foundation Grand Prix for Science in 2007, joint recipient with Christine Seidman, and Katz Prize for Cardiovascular Research awarded by Columbia University School of Medicine in 2008 to, to Together with Christine and the Distinguished Scientist Award from the American Heart Association in 2013 and the Sarnoff Cardiovascular Research Foundation Mentorship Award in 2014. He's also a member of the National Academy of Science since 2007 and the Institute of Medicine. Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us today and welcome. Ellen, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, let me see if I can do this. Can everybody see my, I hope everybody can see my slide. Oh. Yes, just, yeah. um, good morning, at least good morning here in Boston. Um, hopefully, uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank Ellen, thank you for that very kind introduction. It did make me feel very old, but other than that, it was a lovely introduction. I think it's, as you noted, um, I, Cricket Seidman or Christine Seidman and I um, run our laboratory together. And that's important today because um, between us, we're an MD, PhD. Cricket is a cardiologist. And everything I know about the heart, um, I learned from her. Um, and if you have really important questions about cardiac physiology, I hope that you'll come to the breakout session and ask the two panelists who are both um, physicians and cardiologists um, and have a much better chance of answering questions of cardiac physiology than I. Um, so and the, so that's Norbert Hubner and um, Michaela Noseda will um, are directing the or panelists for the breakout session. Um, I just also wanted to point out our other collaborators who have, without whom obviously um, our collection of samples and uh, analysis. Uh, and um, analysis of cardiac tissues would, would not have been possible. Okay, so just to remind you, why do we care about the human heart? And in, in addition to the fact that if, as we're making a human cell atlas, we of course should include every major organ. The heart is a particularly important one. Um, heart failure is a leading cause of death in the United States and uh, until um, the pandemic, um, but hopefully it will return to being, or presumably it will return to being the leading cause of death. Um, and Heart failure, it reflects a uh, complete pump failure of the pump function of the, of the heart to um, produce, produce enough blood for, to, for survival. So um, one of the questions that we clearly have as part of the cell atlas is to understand what are the, uh, what's the composition of the walls of the myocardium so that we can eventually perhaps um, uh, modulate some of the changes that occur in the human heart during, um, over the course of our lifetime and perhaps um, in, improve health. So um, the human heart, just to remind all of you, this is a, in males around um, between 40 and 50 years old, males have an average weight, heart weight of about 290 grams. Females are, have a slightly smaller heart, and this will come up as we think about the cell atlas. Why, how is it that the smaller heart um, is compensated? That basically reflects that we believe primarily a difference in body mass. Um, males obviously have a slightly larger body mass and so they have a, a larger heart. Um, an important fe feature of the heart is that it has, an, we all know that it has a heart rate of between 60 and 100 beats per minute. And um, importantly, the stroke volume is about 70 milliliters per beat. Um, actually men and women have approximate, even though women have a smaller heart size, they have an approximately equal stroke volume. Their, their chamber size enlarges somewhat more than uh, 
net. When this study started, and as I was trained in sort of my uh, ad hoc way of learning cardiology, we really thought of um, initially of cardiac tissue consisting of cardiac myocytes, the contractile cells of the heart, and then non myocytes. After a while, and many, we even for years called them fibroblasts, but that was clearly a misnomer. There are many other cell types in the heart, and it wasn't until the cell atlas that we really now have a very good dictionary of the cell types that participate in cardiac function. And I just want to tell you about how we got to this dictionary and what we think, hope to learn from it. So the approach that we took was to use donor hearts, so or failed donor hearts. So the cardiac transplantation is perhaps um, I like to think of it as the um, real, the, really one of the very first gene therapies that have been successful. So if an individual has a genetic mutation that impairs their cardiac function or any other mechanism that leads to cardiac failure, um, cardiac transplantation is a solution. It's a very expensive and it, it's not it's not something any of us look forward to, but it's become a major industry. And part of that process is that many donor hearts are collected. Um, some of those donor hearts, even though they meet some of the QC, um, and there is a very stringent QC. So by the time a donor heart gets to the patient, it has to be very functional before they implant that. Um, but other kinds of failures have to do with Im immuno incompetence or uh, co contract uh, impaired. So the donor heart doesn't fit the immune system of the recipient. And those are the hearts that we uh, have used for this study. So we have seven male donor hearts and seven female donor hearts. They range between 40 and 70 years. And at two sites um, in Canada and um, in the UK, um, hearts were sampled and they, we picked these six sites indicated here. And then um, each of those sites was studied. And this study started, it was supported initially by the CCIC network it's a number of years ago, um, at a time when it was unclear whether nuclei or single cells would be a better way to make, uh, to, to approach single, this type of experiment. Um, so we actually have a hybrid of both single cells and separate, separated nuclei. To make a long story short, I'd say that um, for us and in studying the heart, um, sort of the nuclei, nuclei approach have won out, but it was unclear at the beginning. One of the major issues of using single cells is that the cardiomyocyte, for those of you who know about cell size, the, the cardiomyocyte is remarkably large. So this 100 micron, uh, micron cell, when you put it in this, most of the single cell um, devices, whether it's the chromium tanx or dropsy, um, it clogs up the pores. You can't separate the, the cardiomyocyte that way. So um, if we want to study cardiomyocytes, which are obviously a major cell type in the myocardium, um, we NukeSeq is clearly a better way to go. Um, there has was and remains, I think, in some circles, a little concern that some cell nuclei are more stable than others. In the in the heart, I think um, our current approach is to assume that, or if we use the same technology, if we make isolated nuclei, and um, we have a protocol that I'm happy to it's actually shared, I believe, on the web page. Um, but where, if there are any questions about it, I'm happy to discuss it either in the breakout or you can write me later. But this, the, this approach of being able to freeze tissue and then make nuclei was actually a game changer. Prior to the availability of the nuclei methodology, obviously samples um, had to be fresh and it was really, really problematic getting a donor heart tissue from the operating room to the research laboratory to make single cells and, I mean, and group in the team in um, Cambridge uh, really uh, revolu uh, put, made a remarkable effort to get seven samples, which were um, characterized both by single cell and by um, single nuclei. At the end of the day, um, there are 123,000 um, uh, cells in our current data freeze and 360,000 nuclei. And these are divided up among um, 82 tissue samples. And we think that we've gotten a very nice sampling of the data. Just to give you a little more of the metrics, we think there are roughly, um, we're, we're sampling between 800 and 2,000 genes per nucleus with about 2,400 UMI. There's a somewhat different distribution per cell type. Um, I think uh, it's important to point out that this technology, that this project started long enough ago that um, some of the samples were uh, collect, were studied using the chromium 10x V2 chemistry and some were studied using the V3 chemistry. And that, that does turn out to be a real significant technical difference. And um, we've 
expend considerable effort trying to reduce the batch effects of those two technologies. But uh, I will say in my dreams well, going forward, and then certainly as we study disease tissues, we're going to hopefully stick with one uh, technology because that transition was not as smooth as we would like. Okay, so what do we what have we learned from all this? We've identified instead of the two, basically two major cell types that we identified previously, we can now say fairly clearly there are 11 different cell lineages, so we call them cell types, 11 different cell types that are labeled here. Um, and then by subcluster, so this is a UMAP projection on the left. If we subcluster those, we see we break those up into cell states. The distinction, as you can see from the pictures there, the cell states are much less clearly defined. The, it's, the borders are much fuzzier and um, defining cell states, which for example, BCM1 and BCM2 clearly are adjacent to one another. And there are cells that in, we find later um, look more like a subset of the BCM1 cell types than um, of the BCM2 cell types. Um, but I think that's to be expected as we go forward with this technology and our dreams as we measure, are able to uh, study deeper um, Re or more diversity of RNA sequence will perhaps be able to distinguish these cell states more precisely. But at the moment, um, this method does define these 65 different cell populations. There are clearly differences in cell distribution. Um, I hope you can see it's on my slide, it's below my bar, but um, I hope you can see that basically if we compare males and female hearts, um, the male hearts and the female hearts are really remarkably similar with the exception that um, there are more um, cardiomyocytes in men, uh, sorry, in women than in men, the percentage that in, in women is greater than in men. And this we think is related to the fact that although the hearts are somewhat smaller, they have, um, a, and they have larger ventricle and they have in, um, in, enhanced contractility to achieve the same um, stroke volume. So one question that we could ask is what's the relation, is there any stoichiometric relationship between the different cell types between, with, between, in um, any given tissue? And having 80 different samples, we could um, ask in those different samples, is there any correlation between this percentage in say a ventricular cardiomyocyte in an endothelial cell or a cardiomyocyte? And these are the coefficients of correlation. You can see, and I've indicated in run read the ones that after von Froney correction, the ones that we think are statistically significant. And there's really a remarkable um, reciprocal relationship between the number of cardiomyocytes and the endothelial cells and fibroblasts. I, maybe I shouldn't have used the word remarkable. In, in hindsight, we can say, oh, that, that makes sense because if we hit a vessel or as we choose a piece of tissue to, to analyze it, we have more vessel or more endocardium or less endocardium, we'll end up with more or less um, non-cardiac myocytes. So the correlation there is quite good. Um, it, uh, given that women have uh, more cardiomyocytes, it takes fewer fibroblasts or endothelial cells or non-myocytes to, to replace those cells um, than men, um, even though we think that the uh, cell size is approximately the same. So we can go and look at, start looking at regional differences and that starting start to ask um, what are the uh, differences in the different cell populations that we've identified. Um, certainly one interesting cell type is um, out this. So A is for the atrial. So atrial cardiomyocyte 2 has a remarkable increase in a, um, one of the marker genes. And we've identified, and this is available in, the, in our uh, the, the, with the publication, there are marker genes for each of these cell states. One of the very prevalent marker genes for this um, CM2 is hepcidin or HAMP. Um, and it's indicate it's identified here um, using RNA scope, um, and clearly there are HAMP positive cells and HAMP negative cells that are myocytes. I should say so. Um, the green denotes troponin T, a major sarcomere protein, and it's present in every cardiac myocyte. Um, so HAMP is uh, pre is turned up in the alpha cardiac myocytes, and it's particularly prevalent in the right atria, and that actually makes sense. HAMP plays a role in um, uh, it's an iron binding protein and it's involved in uh, dealing, dealing with binding oxygen eventually. And the entire, the right ventricle is obviously contains deoxygenated blood. And it's not a surprise that uh, we, the cells and the tissues would want to have better access to uh, oxygen. And they seem to do that by taking advantage of HAMP and other molecules that um, in increase the uh, availability of oxygen in the cell. Um, other 
uh, there are in the in the left ventricle we identified um, BCM3 is another cell type of particular interest that we really want to track in disease samples um, because this seems to be a cell that has um, a number of stress genes. So this is an already stressed cell. And one of our questions was in stress tissue, and it's clear that there are stress cells within the myocardium. Are these going to be localized anywhere, particularly with throughout the myocardium, or um, is there any obvious uh, spatial relationship between these stress cells and their position in the, in the left ventricle? And so far, we've not been able to detect that, but um, we're hoping again that in disease where we already have started to see significant increases in the numbers of these stress cells so we can understand better what it is that stresses some of these cells and um, why they get turned on. And eventually, um, we'll, hope, we'll hopefully have better understanding of um, the fate of these um, of this particular set of stress um, of cells that are responding, apparently responding to stress. John, two minutes, please. OK, um, just very quickly then. Um, I just uh, actually, this is just a slide to remind you that um, or to mention that ACE2 or um, a receptor that's uh, expressed in, in the myocardium um, is, is, the co is the coronavirus 2 receptor and we can identify the ACE2 receptor. It turns out it's not expressed in cardiomyocytes, which is perhaps why the, the heart is basically uh, to a large extent spared um, the uh, issues associated with uh, COVID-19, um, but it is expressed in pericytes and fibroblasts, which is very similar to the lung. I think I'll skip this slide. I just wanted, so what are our early insights? We've seen that um, men um, have fewer cardiomyocytes as a percentage than women. Um, there's a negative correlation between cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts. Uh, we've defined the different cell populations, 11 cell populations and 65 cell states. Um, I just want to mention that going forward, an obvious um, approach is to ask what happens to the normal heart, which is shown here in um, two forms of inherited heart disease. So mutations that we and others have identified lead to either hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the heart wall is thickened or dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart wall is thinned. And of course, it'll be of interest to ask what happens to the cell composition of those tissues um, in response to these genetic mutations. And those diseases lead to very dramatic myocyte death. And then finally, um, certainly through the CZI and I, somebody, we, we hope eventually, um, there'll be a very important question as to what happens to the heart during the pediatric year. So immediately post-birth to the young adulthood, as the body grows, the heart grows, just to remind you, all myocytes or stop, they, they're dividing all through embryonic development, but then shortly after birth, they stop dividing. And basically the number of myocytes that you have within a couple of months post-birth to the rest of your life. Those are the, all the myocytes you get. And what happens is that the myocytes change size. How that change in size is reflected in cell composition, I think is something that um, the Heart Cell Atlas approach will allow us all to answer. And I think I'll stop there and just um, to take advantage, this is the last picture we took before the pandemic shut us down. Um, and I've indicated the um, people who've really done all the work, Dan Reichardt, Emily Nadelman, and Dan DeLauter. And um, I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Uh, thanks uh, uh, for submitting your questions to Slido. Please continue doing that. So the first question is- Can I stop can, sharing or should I stop sharing? Uh, sure, unless you will have to go back to one of the slides uh, depending on the question. Okay. So the first is, can you discuss further validation approaches that help understand the effects of tissue processing and cell extraction on transcriptome diversity and cell type identification? Yeah. So, um, as I said, we did try for non for non myocytes to compare um, uh, the distribution of uh, nuclei in cells, and actually the correlation was remarkably good, with a single exception of endothelial cells. Um, some endothelial cells seem to be underrepresented, uh, or they definitely had a different distribution. We're currently trying to understand that a little better um, using basically RNA scope as a validation method. The other validation method that we do have is that if we make what we call a pseudo bulk, if we reconstitute all of this uh, reads that we get out of a single cell analysis and compare it to bulk RNA sequencing, um, that correlation is remarkably good. So I actually feel that um, at least with the nuclei approach, we have a very good representation of um, total RNA using these two methods, um, RNA scope and then bulk RNA sequencing and comparing the bulk RNA sequencing. Because if a single cell drops out and a single cell type drops out and then we compare that to, uh, and, and we recognize those genes that are marker genes for those cell types, we have a good understanding of what the relative distribution of cell types is 
even just looking at the bulk RNA. Okay, great. The next question is, did you find more cell type and SNUC RNA-seq data compared to single cell RNA-seq? So it's, it's a little bit tricky because uh, most of the single cell analysis was done using V2 chemistry and clearly V3 chemistry gives us um, better representation both with single cell and single nuclei. There was, prob there was probably a better representation in V2 chemistry. There was a better representation of um, single, uh, of RNAs we could sequence deeper in the single cell tissue than we could in the nu single nuclei data. Um, but it was not very dramatic. And the benefit of having cardiac myocytes was so outweighed the uh, um, perhaps loss of information by getting smaller numbers. And just to say, our feeling is that when we work with human tissue, there, the advantage of being able to work with frozen tissue so far outweighs the disadvantages that might occur, which we haven't even proven yet, but which might occur from using the uh, single cell versus the nuclei that um, for certainly for all our disease studies, we're gonna go forward. And I hope with the pediatric studies, we're gonna go forward using the single nuclei approach. Great, thank you. Next question, uh, would love to hear more about the specific differences in analysis for two sequencing methods in terms of impact on data. Maybe we'll come in discussion, but uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm not quite sure. Can you say that again? Uh, would love to hear more about the specific differences in analysis for two sequencing methods in terms of impact on data. So the analysis, maybe I'm not understanding it. Our downstream analysis, whether it was single cell or single nuclei, was essentially the same. It wasn't that, so the computational approaches were the same. We, I didn't say it, but basically uh, we use, a, a, a we think a very stringent QC to remove mitochondrial reads and uh, cells that have, are, have an overrepresentation of, or you know, for, are defective in one way or another. Um, their UMIs are low or their gene count is low or high. Um, so that filtering was, we think, quite important. But, and the filter, obviously the filtering steps are different for single cells and single nuclei. Um, but once filtered, I don't think that the computational approaches, the downstream computational Oh, that's actually not true. You're you're right. So, um, in the in nuclear RNA, obviously, we're, or in the nuclei sample, we actually use uh, a line to a somewhat different use a somewhat different or a different uh, GTF file, and we use uh, include basically uh, unprocessed RNA. And it's very obvious that there's a lot of unprocessed RNA in our single nuclei samples, um, and so there is a difference there. Um, but we don't beyond just being sure that we include a much broader uh, de definition of, gene, of a gene um, in the sing in single nuclear data. We don't do much, we don't do any, there are no other differences as far as I know in the um, sequencing approaches or the Okay. Approaches. So we have uh, time for one more question. On range of pathology from don donor hearts, were there latent subgroups or cell types identified that had unique individual prognosticators for types of pathology, perhaps an early stage or so other donor specific markers. Yeah, so just to be, just to restate, we went out of our way to find as normal hearts as possible. Um, for there was even a, a single heart where it was very clear that individual, although it had passed many QC steps on the way to getting to the laboratory. Um, it had clearly had a very serious myocardial infarction. So uh, we omitted that sample from the study because we'd be comparing these normal hearts to this infarcted heart. Um, it was very clear from the histology and we actually put it through this process and you could see right away, yep, this is a really different heart. So I think this is not the data set where we wanna to start to, to look at how these different cell types are perturbed. Um, in disease, but rather we, we see this as, again, the sort of the cell atlas. This is the, the baseline and we're eager to understand in these disease states what happens to these different cell populations. And that we think that's um, clearly a, a very important direction. That's exactly why we make cell atlases. But here we're not, there's with only 14 samples, we're really, and again, with all normal hearts, we're the we think the best biology that we can understand is to find the cell types and compare perhaps males and females. but um, we're not really thinking too much about uh, pathology. Okay. John, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, 
we are ready to move on to the second part of the webinar and we're very grateful to welcome Christopher Buckley. Uh, uh, Professor Christopher Buckley obtained a degree in biochemistry from the University of Oxford in 1985 with subsequent undergraduate training in medicine at the Royal Free Hospital in London in 1990. His postgraduate medical training was in general medicine and rheumatology at the Hammersmith Hospital in London under Mark Walport and Dorian Haskert and John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. He obtained a PhD, uh, Dr. Philosophy arising from a Wellcome Trust Clinical Training Fellowship with John Bell and David Simmons at the Institute of Molecular Medicine in Oxford in 1986, funded by Wellcome Trust Clinician Scientist Fellowship. He joined the Department of Rheumatology in Birmingham later that year. And in 2001, he was awarded the, uh, an MRC Senior Clinical Fellowship and in 2002 became Arthritis Re uh, Research UK Professor of Rheumatology. In 2012, Christopher was appointed Director of the Birmingham NIH, uh, NIHR Clinical Research Facility. In May 2017, Christopher took up a new joint academic post between the Universities of Birmingham and Oxford as Director of Clinical Research at the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology in Oxford and Director of NIHR Infrastructure in uh, Birmingham for Birmingham Health Partners to direct the Arthritis Therapy Acceleration Program. Christopher, thank you and welcome. Well, it, I see what you mean, John, when it seems makes you feel a little bit old. I'm 58 now and uh, all these things. It's like reading your obituary, isn't it? Um, oh, dear. But that's very kind of you. Um, so let me start sharing my slides. Um, uh, hopefully, um, right, let's get them big. And Top panel presenter mode. Okay. On the right. right. Can you, yeah. oops, I need to go back to the beginning. Right. Um, okay, so um, uh, today I'm, I'm gonna follow on very nicely from John who did a brilliant job of showing you the normal heart. And I'm gonna show you disease today, not that we aren't interested in normal because I'm a clinician and I can't understand abnormal till I understand normal. But what's the point of having an atlas if we don't use it? So if we we're Christopher Columbus and we had an atlas, we need it to sail the ocean blue. Um, and so using this atlas, I want to try and show you today the implications of that for designing new types of clinical trials and how we will use them in the same way that hematologists have been able to utilize a, a, a knowledge of the blood atlas. Um, but how do we do that for these diseases? So I'm a rheumatologist, as I mentioned to you, um, uh, and we're interested in how we can get better drugs for all these diseases. But if I were to say to all the people on the call, you know, how many genes are there in the human genome? They'd say 20,000 and they'd be roughly right. And if I were to say, how many organs have we got? They'd say 80. But if I were to ask you how many individual cell types make up a joint, as my son said to me, what kind of professor are you dad that you don't know how many Lego bricks I need to make a joint? That's the fundamental question of the Atlas. But why are we doing it? It isn't just to design new drugs and to do all these things. No point having a drug if you don't know whether it's going to work or not. So how are we going to move towards a situation like the hematologists have where they're lucky, they have a single mutation in a gene called hemoglobin. They know the cell type. It's a red cell because it's the only cell that expresses hemoglobin. And they know the clinical consequence of that is people are pale and breathless and they can give back plaque red cells and they can make them better. So we need to get like the hematologists. And how do we solve that? Well, today I'm going to use the analogy of the physician's periodic table. Those of you who are physicians on the call will know what I mean. It's very hard to be causal as a, as a practitioner. You end up being correlative the whole time. Whereas in some specialties like endocrinology or, or, or um, uh, cancer, particularly the, the, bl the blood cancers, you can be correlative because you can say this causes that. And so the problem we've got is we've not been able to move from these mechanisms that are being targeted by drugs to the end organs without understanding the bit in the middle. So if you were a chemist and you didn't know the periodic table, how would you make sense of the world? So how on earth do you expect your physicians to make sense of the diseases they see in front of them when they're purely descriptive because we don't know the cellular basis of rheumatoid? Until the atlas you've just seen, we wouldn't even know the cellular basis of heart disease. 
right? So we have this link that's missing between the pathology and the genes and the targets and the endpoints that we read out without knowing the bit in the middle. And that is the hypothesis that that will transform the way we look at disease. So I'm gonna tell you today um, actually about di a disease, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. This was published some time ago as part of the Accelerating Medicines Program. I haven't time today to tell you about the normal stuff, but um, Sarah Snelling, who, who leads our, um, our, our part of the Atlas, will in, in due course, I'm sure, uh, we'll have different parts of our, our Atlas being shown. But today I'm gonna to show you this data. This was a beautiful collaboration between the UK and America, um, 10 clinical sites, all done in, in, in Boston. And then basically these are the populations I'm gonna show you today. There are more, but these are the ones that we're gonna focus on today. You can't have an atlas without tissue, right? And I, I wonder if you think, how do you get it? Not easy to get uh, diseased tissue or even normal tissue unless you can get it out of the joint. If you, imagine how hard it was to get the heart. Diseased hearts, you then got to go <laughs> do heart biopsies. But pretty much in the UK, we biopsy anything that moves apart from the, the brain. Um, um, but we're keen on getting tissue because the truth is there. The truth is in the tissue. If you want to find gold, look in a gold mine. Don't go and look in a tin mine. So we have to go into the tissue, grab it out. And here's Andrew and, and uh, Kareem uh, doing exactly that. And we get these tissues, which we can then analyze. So two revolutions, single cell sequencing and tissue. So the story I'm going to tell you today is following that analogy. The chemical elements. Imagine if you didn't know that lithium went with fluoride or chloride. How would you make sense of the world? Well, how do we know what nerves go with which muscles? They're forming a family, brain cells, immune cells, skin cells. And I'm going to tell you the story of three families in the joint, fibroblasts, macrophages, and T cells, and taking you through that analogy. The first family is the fibroblast. Now, this is, uh, do look in nature this week. There's a terrific paper of cross cross anatomical fibroblasts. Turns out there's a universal fibroblast that you find in almost all organs from which every fibroblast comes. Um, and that's just as important as a hematopoietic stem cell from which everything else comes. Fascinating cell, interested in John's story because some of his fibroblasts respond to IL-6 and maybe that's the mechanism by which inflammation drives heart disease. Um, fascinating, uh, and IL-6 of course is my, it, it, rheumatologists block it because of, of rheumatoid. Here you can see, we know that there are at least four types, there are probably a few more in, in um, the joint, two of which are enriched in rheumatoid arthritis and one is enriched in osteoarthritis. And blow me down, the population enriched in rheumatoid is the one driving inflammation. And we can show this in mice by transferring an equivalent of population in mice and it drives inflammation. And in the lining layer where you get osteoarthritis is a completely different, that modifies matrix. So fibroblasts are not the same, some are found in rheumatoid, some are found in osteoarthritis, and they do different things. Macrophages, four again, two enriched uh, um, in rheumatoid and one enriched in uh, um, osteoarthritis. And interestingly, in rheumatoid, that population disappears. Um, and so rheumatoid is a disease of loss of this population as opposed to osteoarthritis, which is gaining of it. You can't understand disease unless you look at the tissue. Single cell is brilliant, but where are the cells located in relation to each other? I guess if you want to find John, uh, John's wife, if you find him, you'll find her sooner or later. And so next neighbor analysis is very important. And what we learned from that is there are clear rules about where these fibroblasts and macrophages are located. So here's the, the synovium, here's the lining layer that's marking lubricin. This is what PRG4 is, lubricates the joint. And these populations in the sublining are completely different to the lining and never the two shall meet. This is a boundary as important as the right side of the heart is to the left side of the heart. But importantly, there never occur events. You don't get endothelium in the lining layer, just like you don't get endothelium in cartilage. And these rules are very important as we map the single cell data onto the physical space that we see. And of course, now we want to see what's happening uh, in disease. But this is important because you, you could start to impute now what the function of these cells are. So in a cartoon way, for the first time, we're able to say that rheumatoid arthritis is a disease where you get expansion of a particular set of population of macrophages and a particular population of fibroblasts. So the cellular formula equivalent to the chemical formula is M1, F4, F1, F2. 
that's a typo, should be two, not 22. Um, so like we would have carbonate or hyd hydrogen uh, bicarbonate um, or carbon monoxide, they're all variations. And John, you put it beautifully when you said it's the stoichiometry that goes wrong in disease. Uh, just like Bill Clinton said, it's the economy stupid. Well, it's the, it's the stoichiometry that's abnormal in these diseases. You don't get brand new cell types, except in cancer. It's just the ratio of one to the other is changing, just like the red cells would drop in anemia and the platelets would stay the same. So rheumatoid, a disease that's got this particular cellular formula, and OA is completely opposite, as different as the right side, the heart is to the left. Pulmonary hypertension, very different to systemic hypertension. Osteoarthritis is nothing to do with the sublining, nothing to do with the, the vessels, all to do with fibrosis of the lining layer, which is expanded in this M2, F4 um, formula. T cells, what about them? Well, of course, rheumatoid is an autoimmune disease with uh, autoantibodies, but fascinatingly, um, this population is enriched. That T cell population is only found in seropositive patients, not seronegative, and not in tonsil, only in synovial tissue, and therefore potentially could be targeted now. Um, and in fact, trials are beginning to target some of the molecules on this cell. So what we can say, is just as we have a periodic table, we have a cellular table that defines disease. I'm not talking about normal today, but it will be basically normal will be, you know, cells aren't born with original sin, their stoichiometry changes. And so what we're seeing is enrichment of these populations of, of, of um, fibroblasts and macrophages and this population of T cells. So rheumatoid is a disease of these expansions and osteo is a disease of that expansions. So, why would that matter? Well, we need to understand normal. And for another day, um, we'll tell you about the developing joint. This is funded by the MRC. Here are all the folks involved in that. And this is looking at tendons, um, as well as cartilage and bone and all the usual things. Um, but today, I'm not going to tell you about that. But just suffice to say that often, and we're starting to see this, the adult uh, origins of disease come from the embryo. So the fetal origins of adult disease and you recapitulate many of the ontological programs later on. So, you know, osteoarthritis is a disease of the distal interphalangeal joints, not the proximal. And we're starting to see important differences in the cell types that you see in the different fingers, but also in the shoulders. Um, and another time we'll tell you about our fetal atlas. So that information about the cellular basis is really critical because now you can start to say, aha, I found a cell that I see now that's common in both the intestine and IBD, both the anthesis and spondyloarthropathy, uh, or the synovium and both the salivary gland. And if that cell is responsive uh, to say anti-TNF, now I would have a treatment that could go across all these diseases. And the advantage of that is it allows you to do really exciting novel trial design. So you can say, I found a cell that I think is common to all, now I can put it into a, 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 all three diseases into one basket, give the drug and see which of those diseases is responding. So for example, rituximab, who would have thought is useful now in rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis and diabetes. Why? Because it's depleting a common B cell, which is involved in making autoantibodies. And so it revolutionizes the way you think about how you, you do studies because now the cell type becomes the marker. The marker is the mechanism. And here's an example of the kind of really amazing transformations post COVID as well as helped us where we do these platform trials. This is basically running um, multiple arms at the same time. Birmingham delivered the first trial called the matrix lung trial with 42 arms. So this is the power of Bayesian statistics. And if you give the statisticians a cell type that they know is the same, this is the annotation of um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis and rheumatoid. And you, you found a cell type in rheumatoid that now interestingly you find identical cell type in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. You can target that common cell with a drug and you can ask the statisticians, tell me how many patients I need per arm. And the outcome in the trial is a change in that population. You know, it's nothing to do with patient reported outcomes. It's really hard and you only need about 16 patients per arm to show a 50% change. Um, and, and don't forget, those of you who are physicians, we practice medicine in a Bayesian way. We take into account the past, whereas in conventional trials that are, are, are done in a, in a silly way, in my view, 
you have a p-value where you're not allowed to take into account the past. And in fact, you even exclude patients who've got comorbidities. Completely silly. The Atlas, I think, will change all of that. So I've gone through fast because there was a bit to catch, lots of people to thank. I've thanked them along the way, um, but you'll hear more from these uh, folks telling you about all kinds of other joints. Interesting, uh, unlike the heart we, where we've only got one, we've got 200 joints, fascinating uh, organs there are. Without them, we couldn't move. But these are really big collaborations. You can't answer big scientific questions unless you collaborate. So happy to take any questions at that point. Christopher, thank you so much. Fascinating talk. Uh, the question um, in Slido, please keep posting your questions there. Uh, the first one is, what are the progenitor cells for the cell types that are differentially high, low, and rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis? Are they renewable? Good point. So um, as I would say, have a look in Nature this week. Brilliant piece of work from uh, the Tan Shannon Turley's lab about the so-called universal fibroblast. Um, and um, we'll have to tell you a little bit more when we look at tell you from the embryo about the origins of these. Um, but we think there's a limited origin. Um, the lining layer fibroblast is the one that's going to drive osteoarthritis. The sublining is uh, driving rheumatoid. Whether they have a common precursor, we're not entirely sure, um, but uh, it, they may do. But I think the lining layer is more in keeping with the chondrocyte the sublining is more in keeping with the pericyte. Okay, uh, second question. For single cell atlas of disease, what is the minimum samples that should be sequenced? I guess samples in terms of number of cells? Numbers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously we try with our QC to get 10,000 cells. Um, we don't need to do single nucleus seq in, in these things that we've been looking at, it works. Synovium, we've had five years of sending synovial tissue all around the world. We know how to digest it, it's pretty robust. Um, but we don't like to work with less than 5,000 minimum, uh, otherwise it will fail QC. Okay, uh, thank you. The next one is, did you identify any novel or rare cell types? Well, of course, uh, you don't know what you don't know. Um, certain cells uh, get lost, fat cells difficult because they'll get lost in the droplets, right? So you never find adipocytes unless you specifically enrich for them. And the trouble is the more you enrich, the less the bigger picture you have. So you know on your Google Maps, you, you make it, you can start big and then you go down, down, down. Um, so you have to balance enrichment of populations you're missing versus not. Neutrophils are also lost a lot of the time. We don't see them in the tissue, but we are picking up lymphatics and glial cells. Um, and particularly in the embryonic atlas, we've got some interesting cell types, but we don't see things that we don't kind of expect from what we've known of, you know, hundreds of years of anatomy. As I said, I think, as John put it very nicely, this is all about the stoichiometry, changing carbonate to carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide and view the drug as the catalyst it's changing and how you have a catalyst that breaks down carbon dioxide is very different to carbonate. And so the trick will come in using those drugs to work out a little bit about what's going on. Thank you so much, Christopher. And uh, John, thank you as well again.